Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. And I'm bringing my mic in. Start again. Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Bruce McCurdy. Welcome, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Uh, yeah, I was off to my usual auspicious start there. Um, I'm doing uh, pretty good. I've just been... Man, I have been working, working, working. That's all, that's all I can say. It's, there's a lot to, I've been writing about this COVID thing, and there's a huge file to master both around the economics, the medicine, and the politics of it. It's just a lot of work to get a hold, yeah. grab, get a grasp on it. Yeah, well, you're certainly in the, uh, in the wheelhouse of what the news is about these days. Many people just can't get enough on the COVID. And... Uh, uh, may, most of us wish it would go away, uh, and some Everyone, of us think, well, we, we should have some news on the COVID, and we should spend some of our lives doing something a little more enjoyable yeah. that. You're talking about that you wish the news would go away, of course. Yeah, oh, everyone wishes the too. COVID, everyone wishes yeah. the COVID would go away, and I would be happy to never write another COVID story. Like, if they, hey, we got a cure tomorrow, that would be the best story. That'd, and be, then we could just, that'd be a story. Yeah, yeah that'd be a story. Uh, okay, Bruce. Tonight we're going to uh, we're going to do that uh, do that thing that cult of hockey podcast thing, and tonight we're going to look at a couple topics. We're going to look at the new strategy of the Bakersfield Condors, which is actually really crucial. You know, this year we saw how important um, having a good farm team is to the success of a franchise. Something that hasn't hit home for Oilers fans in probably about fifteen years since kind of the Jarrett Stall. Stole Fernando Pisani, Sean Horkoff group came through mm-hmm. the farm and made the orders. Since then, it's been pretty freaking dry in terms of players coming through the farm system and making the team until this year. Um, but they're going to be changing their strategy, and we're going to talk about that and looking at who might be on the team next year and what the orders might get out of that team. We'll also talk about the interesting proposition of Oilers, GM, Ken Holland being named GM hmm. of the year. Something that um, I hadn't been thinking about, but a uh, well-known Boston blog, the, what's it called? I call it well-known, then I can't remember. The Cup of Stanley Chowder, I think it's called. Cup of Chowder, yeah, the Stanley Cup of Chowder. The oh, Stanley Cup of Chowder, that's it. Um, they, they, they have chowder. a writer who was Chowder, the Chowder. <laughs> they... They offered their opinion that um, Ken Holland would win GM of the Year, one of the writers there. We're going to dig into that as well as a little bit more about uh, the season that he's been having, which you've been digging into on a regular basis. Bruce, let's start with the Bakersfield stuff, though. It's kind of top of mind. It's the post I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So what is the news? What is the new strategy, Bruce, that, that, um, that the Oilers are going to employ here? What are they saying? Well, I just pulled up this thing from uh, our very own Kurt Levins, our uh, our colleague at the uh, Cult of Hockey, and I just had it ready to go, and the page reloaded. This is from March the 8th, so almost a month ago. Kurt, in his nine things, his popular Sunday column, uh, item number six on March the 8th said, I expect there to be a fundamental shift in how and where the Oilers will carry their NHL contracts next season. The club is at 50 right now. It's not an ideal situation. Ken Holland couldn't sign an undrafted 20-year-old if he wanted to, or pick up a guy on waivers, for that matter. Instead of 15-ish NHL contracts in the AHL next season, I would forecast something closer to 9 or 10. More AHL deals, greater flexibility for big club. 9 or 10, wow. Instead of close to 15, so... Okay, so um, why do you think they would do that, Bruce? Have you been thinking about what the idea is, what the plan is? Uh, well, they don't want to be up at 50 contracts anymore. And, they, you know, they got enough guys down in the AHL that don't really figure into the NHL plan. And yet here they are with uh, NHL caliber contracts on the 50-man list. And what for, right? Right. And I think we're probably going to talk about a few of those guys that are on the current team and uh, um, what uh, may or may not happen with those guys. But it sounds like if Kurt is right and uh, early evidence suggests that he's on the money 
as he so often is, that um, uh, they will be replacing some of these sort of borderline uh, veteran pros with, uh, for example, U.S. college free agents, of which they signed four this week, all to AHL contracts. Yeah, so this this is this is why we're digging in right now because of this new mm-hmm. information. Four of these guys were signed. It looks like it looks like the the uh, not the Levin's plan, but the Levin's scoop is is yeah. uh, coming true. And um, so it could be just cost savings. It could be that they don't want to pay as much for. Now, when you sign an NHL contract, you can still sign for NHL AHL money, right? You get a different rate. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, where, where you play, but it, they might be just trying to cut back. They also might be, Bruce, trying to, to cut out a little bit, uh, you know, just free up some ice time for younger players. Could that be another reason that you're Potentially. You're, you're kind of turning this more into like a real super development team with younger players? And that might be, you might be in tough competing in the AHL um, if, if that's the case. But I, I actually don't think that was the problem this year with the team. Well, of course, this is a more veteran AHL team this past year, but injuries just killed them and a few bad personnel moves. So, Bruce, let's just go ahead. I was just going to say, they always have a a couple of these uh, college graduate types, like Bo Sterrett and Shane Sterrett, for that matter, on this year's team that were just free agents signed out of college that worked their way into Bakersfield. And there's no guarantee all four of the new guys are going to make the team. It's just they seem to be stocking up on that style of player. So it suggests there may be a little bit of meat uh, to the bones that Kurt uh, laid down for us. Well, they they also had like Vincent DeHarnay, Stephen yes. Yacobellis. They had a yes. number of these guys yep. on their roster this year. So every every year you have players like this, but it might just be more of a focus going mm-hmm. forward. And maybe it maybe there is a major cost or some cost saving to be had, and <laughs> that may become a a huger and huger factor in the coming economy that we might be facing is saving some dollars. We uh, had the worst. The worst of the VC brothers, the worst of the Lark- Larkin brothers. They've had a, <laughs> they've had a few guys that go, oh, that's an interesting name, and then oh, wrong one. <laughs> anyway, sorry to interrupt, David. That's okay. So here's guys who I don't think will be back, Bruce. And you can, mm-hmm. you, when I'm done the list, you can, you can, I, I might interject a little bit on each one. But um, I okay, I don't think Cameron he bigs back. He didn't have much of a year. He didn't have make much much of an impression down there. Um, Marcus Granlin, he's at, he played down there. He's an NHL free agent. I don't think he's back next year. Um, Brad Malone was, uh, a leader on the team, but I, I doubt he's back. Uh, Bo Starrett, Jacobellis, I don't think they're back. Colby Cave, I think he'll be moving on. Um, was it Nolan VC or Noah VC? I can never remember. Nolan. He's gone. No, Nolan VC. For sure. He was an, on an NHL contract. That was probably the worst NHL contract. Well, maybe than Brandon Manning. I mean, he wasn't pay, he wasn't paid any NHL money, but like he was the weakest player who was on an NHL contract. Maybe Ostap Safin was a little weaker. I don't know. I think Safin's a better player. Jacob Stuckel, possibly mm-hmm. he'll be back on an NHL contract. He was okay. Thomas Yurcho, I think he'll be going somewhere else. So um, Tough Logan. Luck with yeah, tough luck. Logan Day, um, I think he'll be moving on. Uh, in that, Starrett and Redmond, I think both will be moving on, Bruce. Um, I think this was Starrett's chance, and um, I just don't see them taking another chance on him. He was injured all year, and he's 25, 26. Uh, on the other side, Keegan Lowe and Jake Kulovich, I think both of those guys are gone. Um, I'd be shocked if either of them were back. Lowe played really poor. Uh, you know, he was... Compared to the expectation that he would be their kind of veteran anchor on the team, he didn't really meet that expectation this year. Kulovich gone, and Brandon Manning gone for sure. Hundred uh, percent, like there's zero point zero zero percent chance yeah. of Brandon Manning returning. Philip Broberg uh, will be apparently he's in Holland. Has said he'll be in Sweden this year, and uh, I think that's a really good idea keeping him there. So, any of those guys, Bruce? Do you think I've missed on? Do you think we'll be back and? I mean, I guess Logan Day and Starrett might be. Yeah, Starrett, I mean, he, he, for one thing, he's a group six, so he has his own, he can write his own ticket too. Like, they they, they yeah. don't have rights on him. A couple of these guys, like uh, Day, the owners do have uh, restricted free agent rights on him. So yeah. if the team wants to, 
they can exercise those rights and keep them. In the case of uh, uh, Shane Starrett, the goalie, uh, no such thing. Uh, he's he's uh, been around long enough to earn his Group Six. Uh, Keegan Lowe, I mean, this was a, this was a, a uh, um, from the Shirelli regime a two year contract that he got versus a one year contract that Ryan Stanton got, and I think the if they'd have reversed those when they signed him, the team would have been better off this year. But uh, uh, I think Keegan is uh, going to be heading on to another organization. And uh, Kulovic is, you know, he's he's an okay player as a sort of third-pairing AHL guy on a on an AHL contract, but he's certainly not anything very consequential. They might bring him back. I mean, I yeah, thought last year he was gone, and he came back, and he played this year, so it could happen again. Sometimes these guys, there's certain guys in the, in the minors, they hang, they catch on in a certain city, they become fan favorites or, or whatever, you know, and they, ha- they accept their role and the team wants to have some continuity so they keep them around. But, you know, there might be a, a guy or two like that. But none of the guys you named, uh, I think, have any chance of impacting the NHL Oilers roster ever. Kulovic was plus six goals plus minus, and Logan Day was minus seventeen for what that stat is worth. And sometimes it's it's worth something. You never know. Uh, yeah, I could see Kulovic may begin in an AHL deal, but probably not. Bruce, um, before I think the most interesting guys to talk about are kind of the bubble players. So let's mm-hmm. not talk about them. There's three players on the team that I think could make likely to make well will make play NHL games for sure next year. Just a question of how many. Tyler Benson, who has one year left on his ELC, um, we saw him enough this year. I think I think he's going to make the Oilers next year, Bruce. Okay. Uh, Evan Bouchard. Yeah. Uh, it depends what they do with Benning and Russell, but yes, Bouchard, Bouchard uh, could easily make the Oilers next year as the third pairing uh, D man, puck moving D man, and uh, getting some time on the power play. I could see that happening. I'll tell you, God. Oscar Clefbaum and uh, Ethan Bear are ahead of him, not and Darnell Nurse. Some people think, and William Logason, who's an RFA uh, on an NHL contract. I think the Oilers will um, qualify him and yeah. uh, have him as their seventh D man next year. I think he'd be a, a really solid seventh D man. And you don't want to have Bouchard as your seventh D man. He's got to play. No. So yeah. I could see him. He could certainly start the year like Yamamoto. Play how it could be one yeah. of those. Okay, half the year kid. And like mm-hmm. like Yamamoto, we're calling you up at Christmas. Bouchard was really strong. Um, you know, I'm going to go back, I think, and watch the last 10 games of the year, Bruce, uh, mm-hmm. on AHL.com in the next month or two. There's lots of time to watch uh, old AHL games just so I can um, get up completely up to date with all these players. But Bouchard was, uh, what did he get? He got like, uh, let me just have a quick 36 look 36 points in 54 games is what my memory says. And he really picked it up in the second half. Like that was yeah. not symmetric production. He was much closer to a point of game player yeah. after Christmas or so. He, You know, the, the games that I did see him play, he was fantastic. He was really moving the puck well, shooting the puck well, and his defense was a little bit better each time I saw him. So, um, okay. So let's move. Let's talk about the player's uh, who are kind of signed up or likely to be signed for this team. Mm-hmm. Joe, Joe Gambardella, who had an off year, has one more year on an NHL deal. So he's back. And um, he's a good player, a good veteran AHL player. Cooper Marodi has one year left on his ELC. He's coming off a terrible injury-riddled year. But he is a pro NHL prospect. And maybe um, he could turn it around, but he'll be back in Bakersfield next year. There's Maxim. There's the kind of the the kids, Maximov, McLeod, Samarukov, two forwards and a defenseman who all right. kind of had okay, okayish. Maybe McLeod had a slightly better than okayish rookie year, and the HL they didn't. You know, um, so I, those guys are all on the second years of their ELCs. They're all back uh, for sure yeah. in the HL next year. Um, there's Stuart Skinner um, mm-hmm. back and that for sure there's olivier rodrigue who's graduating from the qm qmjhl the quebec league i think he'll likely be on the team although that's not a sure thing um rafael lavoie graduating from the from the q uh the other second round pick 100 he's on the team and then there's these guys 
so there's and there there's this uh, is his name Anthony Pelusa. Uh, he's a oh, veteran. Yeah. <clears throat> Veteran, he was on an AHL deal. I bet you he comes back as a like, uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's the, the slugger kind of player. That's the kind of player that becomes a fan favorite and and uh, wangles another contract because yeah. uh, everybody loves their heavyweights, as you know. Yeah, especially in the uh, minors. And another guy like him is Luke Esposito, who is uh-huh. a hell of an AHL hockey player. I really yeah, like. Yeah, he he really plays hard. He's good. Yeah, and uh, I think he'll be back. He's a fan favorite. And then there's yeah, these four guys, four guys they signed, Bruce. Um, oh, there's a mm-hmm. DeHarnay, Vincent DeHarnay, who hardly played. But he has one more year left on his, his AHL deal, so he'll be back. Then there's the four guys they signed. Yanis Yanis Yaks, is that it? Mm-hmm. I believe he so. from Latvia, yeah. And mm-hmm. um, Liam Folks. And then there's three, four. Liam Folks, Devin Brasso, and Blake Christensen. All right. um, out of U.S college all of them uh i think they're all pretty smaller forwards who did some pretty good scoring in their uh in their careers in the in the uh, u.s college yeah well no brasso is 61 202 so yeah the other two two guys are smaller and and uh yanis yax is six feet 190 so he's a a bigger d man but these so these are guys um from Lesser known programs, generally speaking, except for Devin Brasso, who's from uh, Clarkson University. So, um, look, it's hard to know. One of them might be the next Patrick Russell, right? I guess that's kind of <laughs> the top end. They work their way boy, up. Boy, they, boy, they, boy. They, come in at, they come in at 23 or 24, and yeah. they just work like crazy, and they make the NHL. That's, Could happen. That's the idea. Three of these guys are 25 before the season starts, and the fourth turns 25 uh, early in 2021. So none of them is a spring chicken. All of them completed the full four years of their college uh, career. So they weren't, uh, you know, it wasn't like they came out of school early to sign. It's like, okay, we're done here and graduated. What next? I want to turn pro. And Bakersfield had a sale on... uh, uh, on contracts they were looking looking to hire and uh, they hired a bunch of guys and all of them well, at least the three forwards showed some uh, little flashes of offensive ability but uh, other than Bruso I think that's how it's pronounced how uh, low tide usually knows he said Bruso uh, 28 games this year 29 points so he actually was a point per game uh, player as a uh, a uh, left shooting center, six one two oh two. So he's actually, you know, he's not a he's not a shrimpy guy, and uh, fairly decent production through really his last three years in in college. So uh, at least from the numbers, you know, straight box cars perspective, uh, he looks like the sort of guy you know is going to get a job in the uh, in the pros and whether. You know, in the case of all these guys, they could easily wind up in the ECHL as easily as they could in in the AHL. So they'll be fighting for they'll be fighting for spots. Okay, Bruce, let's go to the um, guys who are kind of the wild card players who may or may not be there, uh, mm-hmm. may or may not be in uh, Bakersfield next year. So um, in that group, I've got. Uh, let me just fix this one. All right. Ryan Kuffner, who was brought over in the, which trade was it? The green trade or the FNSU trade? One of those trades with Detroit. Ryan Kuffner was part of the, yeah. the puzzle. Mm-hmm. There was, he, he had a really weak scoring year in the HL. There's Ostap Safin. There's Graham McPhee, who's done his four years at Boston College. He was a 2016 draft pick, um, mm-hmm. kind of a rugged winger. There's Apoli Rasanen who played three years at Boston College and had a big year this year, his best year. There's Josh Curry, who had an NHL contract this year. It's up. And, um, man, he is a huge fan favorite in Bakersfield. Uh, There's Philip Berglund from Sweden. Marcus Niemelainen on defense. Dylan Wells in net. uh, And um, Phil Kemp, who's three years at Yale University going into his fourth and mm-hmm. is took a step up this year. It looks like in terms of his play as well. <clears throat> so 
I'll, I'll, I'll just, what do you think about Curry? Do you think he'll be back, Bruce? Well, he's an RFA. So they yeah. do have, uh, they do have um, resigning rights on him. Um, I honestly don't see why they wouldn't. You know, I didn't mind him with the Oilers in 1819. And then this year he never got a sniff for whatever reason. But he led Bakersfield in scoring. He had 24 goals and uh, 41 points, which is pretty pathetic for a team leader. But we have to remember that the team only played uh, just over 60 games, was it? Because they, uh, uh, not even, because they their season got cut short and they were only ever going to play 68. Yeah. So he only played 56 games and it looks like he that's, uh, that's the tops on the, uh, on the team because they had a back-heavy schedule. Uh, and it's, it's the California division, you know, and they say, well, we want to have fewer games because we want more practice time and so on. But every year it seems like they play about two games in October. And then as soon as baseball ends, they start playing a regular style of schedule. So I think it's just trouble competing with baseball and playoff baseball in California. But uh, Maybe college football. Driving the, driving the, the bus there a little bit. So I don't mind anyway. all that extra practice, though. I think that's a really, really good idea. So what do you think he'll be? He this is his this he's had six years in Bakersfield, oh, wow. and and he is uh, you know if he wants to come back, I don't think he'll get an NHL contract though. No. Would you give him an NHL contract? Would you give him another one? I guess maybe, but yeah, he'd be one one of those guys right on the cusp for sure. I mean, he does have NHL experience. Yeah, uh, and, in a and, pinch maybe, eh? And you know, I might be a, yeah a guy that's. That's a, a depth guy that to have the option available as they had this year. I mean, it's not the worst thing, but as Kurt says, they don't want to have 15 of those guys anymore. So, so you say he yes, could a, he Curry. could be a victim. I say just because of his circumstances and him and the guy and the type of player he is and the fact they got rights, I think uh, a good chance, yes. Okay, Appley Rastanen, will he get an ELC or not? <sighs> yeah. I heard tell, I mean, he left after third year of college, and I heard tell he was going home. But, oh, really? Uh, yeah, but, I, you know, as we learned with uh, Philip Berglund and Joachim Niegaard and so on, that these contracts signed uh, uh, over in the uh, um, uh, Nordic countries aren't necessarily cast in stone. They can be sort of negotiating Employees or fallback positions or whatever, and if uh, the Oilers came and offered him a contract, he'd probably sign it. But he did have an uptick in his performance this year in Boston College, but only after he moved to wing. And I think the Oilers are really seeing him as an all-purpose um, sort of lower-end center in the right-shooting Anton Lander mold, as opposed to being any kind of flashy winger. So I'm not sure that. Uh, that Rassanen as a winger is necessarily of as much interest to the Oilers as he was when he played pivot. Yeah, he is now, uh, he'll be 22 in June. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I, 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 I don't think he's a, like, obviously not a hot prospect. Okay. Ostap Safin, Bruce, who was in, this Wichita. year he was in the Wichita Thunder, 54 games, 35 points. So he's on the second year of his ELC. Um, I think he'll probably be in the HL next year would be my guess. You, you yeah. agree? Yeah, he got his reps this year in the ECHL. He's been, he had a, a awful injured um, last year in junior. Yeah. Where everything was set up for him. He was traded to Halifax or hosting the Memorial Cup. And then he could just... He had some kind of core body injury, and he never could get it together. And, and uh, even when he played, he was like a shadow of the guy that we'd seen before, because he's you know he's like six foot five. He's got the wingspan of a condor, and he can uh, you know he really so swoops. To speak. Yeah, yeah, he's he's got speed, and he really swoops in off the wing on on the net. Like there's some things to like there, and, and some some things that need polish. And of course. This year, he needed to get some reps, and they sent him down to the ECHL, and they just left him there. So I think next year, he'll certainly be competing for Bakersfield, but he's a long way away from competing for Edmonton. Okay, Graham McPhee done his fourth year in uh, Boston College. He's a really gritty player, and he had a really great second year. 
in mm-hmm. Boston College, 24 okay. points in 36 games, and then he just crashed the last two years. He's just like nine points in 29 games and then 12 and 34. I don't think the Oilers will offer him a um, ELC. No. What, what would you say? No? I agree yeah. with that. Not unlikely. Okay. Unless, unless they want to sign him and then dangle him as a, as a throw-in in a trade for uh, uh, with Graham McPhee's uh, team there, the Vegas Golden Knights, but Given that, yeah. or George McPhee, sorry, but given that George is no longer the GM there, I mean, even that's a kind of a silly statement. I, I guess just, they could AHL contract if he would take one. Yeah, maybe. I mean, that was the compromise they reached with uh, Vincent DeHarnay, mm-hmm. where they actually, uh, you know, they had the, the draft pick and they liked him, but they didn't like him that much, and they wound up offering him an AHL deal, and he took it. So, I could see that. I can it's, see McPhee. Mm-hmm. He's he's not much of a pro prospect though. He's going to be looking for a landing spot somewhere, isn't he? Yeah, he want to play hockey. Why not? Yep. Okay, uh, let's move on. Oh, Kuffner, Ryan Kuffner. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's it. They traded for him, which you know seems to be an expression of interest in this player. But Bruce, I mean, his AHL scoring was non-existent, and. Um, I, I don't know. <coughs> he was pretty, as, pretty uh, coveted coming out of college, though. Yeah, well, Detroit kind of won a little bit of a bidding war, as I understood. But uh, and he had, you know, he had a lot of goals in uh, in his college years, and then he got to uh, he got to the pros, and the first year at least was an adjustment period. Now maybe he's just one of those players, you know, that needs. Uh, 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 a year to adjust, and then the second year he's fine. But uh, <clears throat> there was nothing he did in the AHL this year that suggested he was uh, close to being ready to, uh, um, you know, make a difference. I'm going to say yes, though, that he'll be on the Condors next year, that they'll bring him back. Because they did, they did trade for him. Yeah. So. Yeah, he, yeah he's 23. Uh, he'll be 24 uh, shortly, but uh, he actually did get NHL games. That's weird. Yeah. 10 games in the NHL, no points. And uh, uh, time, that was at the end of 1819. Like they signed him and he came right into the NHL. And then in 1920, he went down to Grand Rapids and he just had nine points in 32 games, never got called up to Bakersfield or to Detroit. And then he got traded to Bakersfield right at the end of the season, four games, two points. But uh, uh, he was the all-time leading goal scorer in the history of Princeton University, apparently. So, Chris, you just used a Hollandism. You said nineteen in 1920. He uh, yeah, did well, that. 2019, 20 sounds like a, I don't know what it sounds like, but anyway, in 1920. Right. Yeah, I've been I've been listening to Holland too much this week. I've been listening to his old. Uh, <laughs> Press when he, so when he first said it, it sounded so weird. Yeah, in 1919, we're going to, or whatever he said, 29. Yeah, 19, yeah t- anyway, 1920, that was anyway, Kuffner, I mean, he was a throw-in in the trade, and so you'd have to think that, I mean, there's some interest there, and they just maybe, maybe uh, Holland, who signed him in Detroit, thinks, oh, well, I still believe in this player. I want to, I, I haven't given up on him yet. So we can get him in this trade that cost us two, uh, second round draft choices, then uh, uh, let's uh, uh, let's take him as a, as a throw in and see what happens. So I think there's a pretty decent chance he's with Bakersfield next year, Kuffner. Yeah, and Tyler Wright also is with the Oilers now in the organization, and he would have might have been involved with that decision, mm-hmm. and that usually carries some weight. Okay, let's move. Well, we we I guess. Nima Leinen, who's been a uh, long-time kind of um, defensive defenseman in Europe. We'll see what happens there. Maybe maybe yes, maybe no. But Berglund, I think Berglund would be a real coup if yeah. they can bring him in. There's a huge hole there on right D for that yeah, team. Yeah. And he looks like a really good prospect for the Oilers, for the NHL. Give him a year uh, in the AHL and see what happens. I, I really do hope that they sign him and uh, he's part of the team, so... I'm going to be bullish, and, and I'm going to guess that they do sign him, Bruce. Changing oh, I hope his so. That's uh, yeah. That would be uh, 
that would be a good outcome for sure. And it sounded like, I mean, uh, uh, Scott Housen sounded pretty confident that that they were, you know, not only negotiating, but that they had every intention of signing him, and it, he, he seemed to think it would happen. So, and Nima Scott, Linen too. Scott Housen ever been wrong? <laughs> and Nima Linen as well. Did he, did yes. he think they'd sign Nima Linen too? Uh, well, he didn't. He wasn't quite so definitive, but he did say they were talking to him and they wanted him. But in okay. the case of, in the case of uh, Berglund, he uh, he talked specifically about uh, thinking they would sign him. And I had this pipe dream of them bringing over Bro Berglund together as a as a pairing, but uh, apparently they've decided they'd rather have Bro Berg become a Swedish defenseman by playing defense in Sweden. That's an interesting strategy. I and like so, it. Yeah, I don't mind it. So they it's unlikely they'll come over together. It's the bottom line. But uh, uh, Berglund, the time is now. He's 22 years old. He's got 200 games in the Swedish league. You know. If he if he has designs on the NHL, he better start playing on the narrow ice. Yeah, this is this is it. He has a decision to make. Um, okay, there's two other players in the red zone on my chart here that that, that maybe are for the team, maybe not. Uh, Phil Kemp. So he mm-hmm. had a big year at, at Yale. He's a really good defensive defenseman, Bruce. Not much of mm-hmm. a puck mover. Big guy, rangy guy, rugged player. There's a hole, if, especially if they don't bring Berglund over, man, they could use him. But um, I could see him, if you're at Yale, maybe you want to go all four years to Yale, get your degree, if he if he's a serious student, and I suspect that he is. Um, so I don't think he'll come. I think he'll play in Yale one, one more year in Yale. What would you say? Probably. And like many American-born uh U.S. college players, he's got the hammer. You know, he can just play, yeah. it, play out the string and get signed by uh, uh, an American team or force a trade. You know, I mean, we don't have to look very far <clears throat> back in the uh, memory banks to find John Marino getting traded, you know, a very successful sixth-round pick by Edmonton Oilers in 2015, getting traded for a future 2021 sixth-round pick. They didn't even get any higher pick for him. And he went right into the NHL and became a, uh, he had an outstanding rookie year. He was the uh, uh, fourth highest scoring rookie defenseman this year behind three Cracker Jacks and in, in Quinn Hughes, Kale McCarr, and Adam Fox that were one, two, three. And they could be one, two, they could be the three finalists for the for the uh, Calder this year. Uh, there's only one one forward, really, Cuba League was Chicago that might get in the final three. And uh, Marino was just behind them. And Adam Fox is another case in point. Calgary drafted him, great draft pick. There was no way they were ever going to sign him, and they wound up trading with Carolina. And, and Carolina learned he did, they weren't going to sign him either. He wanted to play for the Rangers, so they better trade him to the Rangers, or else he would just sign with the Rangers. So they traded him to the Rangers. We'll see what happens. I mean, Kemp was a Shirelli pick, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Or was he, was he also a Gretzky pick, yes. though? So uh, there yes, is... I believe so. There is some. Let me just check. Twenty seventeen. Yeah, hundred. Yeah. So there's so, so there's that. So the guy who picked him is still with the organization, which might make him think he's got a chance. I mean, Bruce on right defense with the Oilers. There, there is uh, Bear ahead of you. There is Bouchard ahead of you. But yeah. Larson, you know, if you're Kemp, you're thinking, okay, where's Larson going to be in two or three years? Maybe, maybe not in the NA. Maybe not with the Oilers because he'll. You know, whatever happens, maybe he'd be too expensive for the Oilers or and then there's Benning, you know, who knows what's going to happen with Benning. He probably be, in the end become too expensive for the Oilers based on his level of play. So there's a real opportunity, I think, for Kemp to compete um, and make the Oilers in two or three years. And if he wants to do that, might be a good time to jump right now. But I, I think he'll stay in college as well. Bruce, finally, there's Dylan Wells, um, a goalie who's got one year left on his ELC. I think he had a 873 save percentage in Bakersfield last year. Let me just see. 878 save percentage in seven games for Bakersfield last year. Uh, Rod Riggs coming in. In theory, Sterrett could be back. I mean, uh, Jay Woodcroft loved Shane Sterrett uh, the year before. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah. uh, he, he had an 871 save percentage. He only played... 17 games last year he had 
871 in Wichita, 878 in Bakersfield in seven games. Wow. He's going to be in the ECHL next year, I think. Yeah. That's wow. just not, that's not promising enough. 10 uh, games of, in Wichita with a 498 goals against average. That doesn't look too wonderful, does it? <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, he's. Yeah. Uh, that's not uh, good. He's not really found his form in the pros. And I think uh, Skinner and Rodrigue probably have the inside track to be the two. Yeah. In Bakersfield. They, you know, they might want, in a perfect world, they might want to bring Rodrigue up to Wichita and give him most or all of his season at the EH, ECHL being the number one and getting lots of lots of ice time. So that's the other, in which case they'll be looking for some kind of a backup. But it, it wouldn't shock me that they went outside of the organization and found some... Uh, uh, you know, some veteran goalie. Yeah, I could see Wells and Rodriguez in Wichita and either Skinner and Starrett or Skinner and another goalie mm-hmm. uh, all together in uh, in Bakersfield. Yeah, they got all three of the ELC guys next year because uh, Skinner and Wells are on the third year and Rodriguez that spent the last two years sliding back to junior, he's going to be in the mix too. So they got to find places for all three guys. It's going to be an interesting roster next year. A lot of fun. I hope, uh, you know, it'll be in a lot more fun if they sign Berglund and uh, Nima Lyon. And I think that'll be make it that much more interesting. Do you, th- do you think they're going to bring in any kind of vet- older veteran, one or two older veteran guys, kind of in the Brad Malone, Keegan Lowe class? I don't think they are, eh? I, I, I think they'll, Maybe they're going to do that. Maybe a lot of them. They might br- yeah, Maybe I mean, they're one. just as well to bring back their own guys yeah. like uh, Josh Curry as uh you know go uh too far afield but maybe a veteran defense but i mean they gotta they gotta replace uh manning's spot and Lowe's spot for sure and there's a pretty good chance that neither bouchard nor laguson will be available so there's you know there's going to be holes so they may just go out and sign some 30 year old guy that's been kicking around for a while that's reliable at that at that level of play uh, Ryan Stanton type or yeah. Brandon David Brandon Davidson even so yeah you, know, you mentioned of, him the other day and that's a, yeah. that's a good fit for the type of uh, yeah. guy and possibly they you know they sign a tweener and you know give him a give him a um, NHL minimum but a decent AHL salary and have the guy that in a pinch they could call up a guy and you know uh, he, I think they're going to the need NHL that. Before. Looking at the roster, Bruce, I think they're going to need that, like a lefty with some, because I think Lagasin will be in the the age the NHL next year, and they're going to need that player on the left side. They just don't have it, so that's that's one place where I, I do see that an NHL contract being spent uh, <coughs> to bring in a a player who could um, really help the team, uh, the Bakersfield team, kind of be their anchor, because I don't see that anchor right now. Sam Rukov's not quite there. No, he, he's, he's he's pretty much 100% to be in Bakersfield. You know, it, in in one possible future, he hits it out of the park in the first half and he gets called up later in the season. But this year, he was just really finding his way in the uh, uh, in the AHL. So he's got a long way to go. There, there's, there's zero chance that he's ready to make the leap right now. Well, Bruce, we've already been going on for quite a while here, but let's just okay. quickly... Let's just quickly sure. deal with Hall. I like this this idea of Hall and his NHL sure. GM of the year. What do you think? Would you vote for him? Uh, who, would get your, who would get your vote? Well, I think the the guy in uh, uh, the guy in St. Louis has done a pretty good job. Armstrong, you know that <laughs> they, they kept that team, uh, you know, Stanley Cup champion. They've had a few. Uh, uh, they've had a few curveballs thrown at them, such as losing uh, Vlad Tarasenko for basically the entire season, their top scorer, their sort of perennial 40-goal scorer. And yet that team has been soaring um, uh, basically above the West uh, all year long. And, I, you know, I think they've, they've done a dandy job there of uh, shoring up that team. That said, a guy that would trade for Justin Falk and then offer him a huge extension, a huge money, he kind of has me scratch my head a bit, but uh, I'm kind of on. I read your post, of course, and I'm kind of on board with the idea of. Uh, I mean, they usually give these awards to guys that teams that have a sudden one-year improvement, but 
But I kind of think the guys that have had a good team over longer periods of time deserve to be recognized as well. Me so too. I'd rather see Ken Holland be in the running for this award next year when Edmonton's taken a second step forward yes. into the upper echelon of the league. Like, let's, uh, you know, this is hardly mission accomplished at this point. I mean, we've had a good first step, and that's what we've had. But he's getting the Oilers into eighth place with, uh, or whatever, you know, just it barely into the playoff uh, chase with the two best players in the league. I mean, I need to see more uh, before I'm talking about him being the number one out of 31 NHL teams. Yeah, even with the Lucic trade, I mean, that was a pretty big move. But and, and you know, when it comes to mm-hmm. team that are, teams that are kind of like a possible one hit wonders that just shot up in the rankings, Philadelphia. Oh, um, man, the, did they go crazy? They, it was a goal a game better this year over yeah. last year, Bruce, and they had the highest difference in points percentage year to year. I, I don't see it so much though as a GM thing because it's largely the same team. I think as a coach thing, mm-hmm. Alan Vigneault, I think is a should be a really strong contender for coach yeah. of the year, mm-hmm. and um, uh, or, a, 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 as well as Barube, of course. Um, yeah. But yeah, Vigneault, Vigneault, I, I see that as a coach thing more than a GM thing. Um, the uh, the only serious I I would vote for Armstrong personally. Yeah. Uh, I guess this is the GM's vote on this, not uh, right. the media. And of course, we don't vote at all because we're fans. Um, but Joe Sackick, you could make a really strong case for him. And if he won, it would be not a disservice. Um, he's been there a while and he took that that he took that franchise into the gutter. I thought he was going to be fired. I thought he was a terrible GM. Since then, he's just absolutely done wonders transforming that roster into a fast, skilled thrilling and fairly low paid team for the amount of skill on it, not being killed by the cap made some great moves, bringing in Burakovsky and he traded for Nazem Kadri. Um, yes. But he crushed, it out of the park. he crushed it out of the park with the Matt Duchesne trade oh, yeah. a couple of years ago. So it's not really on the radar of this year's award, but that really set the stage when they got what seven or was it even nine players they got out of that by the time all the draft choices came in and so on? It was just a huge influx of uh, of young talent, and uh, uh, they, uh, you know, created some lots of room on the payroll with uh, Matt Duchesne, that, you know, wanted the big bucks, and that was a three-way trade where Colorado was the clear winner. Yeah, and they that, just, you know. But you're right. I mean, that that cleared the payroll and that allowed them to sign guys like Burakovsky. And, of course, uh, the great uh, Valerie Nichushkin plays for Colorado. (laughs) So, I mean, you you got to give points for that MVP candidate. (laughs) I can't say it with a straight face. (laughs) 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 Nichushkin. But fact remains, they picked the guy off the scrap heap. He got 27 points in 65 games. The guy off the scrap heap, and he had a real good year for him. So I mean, credit where due. Let's just—I mean, let's keep the credit where it belongs. But he had at least as good a year as Josh Archibald did, right? I mean, probably better. And yeah. you know, and, and they—they they found a useful player for cheap uh, that uh, that looked like he might be on his way out. So I mean, you know, plus one for that, not plus ten, but plus one. And Sackick's got you know what a few arrows in the quiver, and the and the teams put up pretty good points. So yeah, I could I could see that as being a very reasonable and alternative. Two, but again, multi years work, not just one. Yeah, their two top picks this last year, Bruce, were Bowen Byram. Mm-hmm. They still got him, and the, and Alex Newhook, who just killed it in in uh, yeah. college hockey. So this Colorado team, wow. There's not many teams I would trade the roster of the Edmonton Oilers for, Bruce. You'd have to think long and hard about that team in terms of a straight roster for roster trade, like including all the prospects. I'd still keep the orders. They lost the the draft lottery, eh? They got the the what the first lottery ticket from Ottawa as part of that Duchesne trade, and they Mm -hmm. three other teams all all won the lottery. So Colorado dropped all the way from first to fourth. So they had to settle for Bowen Byram, but. That is a pretty damn nice candidate, and especially when you've already got uh, Kale McCarr and uh, Samuel Girard on your team. You know, all of a sudden you have a surfeit of young, fast, smart, puck-moving defensemen, and man, you got those guys up there. You know, with a 
caliber of forwards they have, especially on their first line, that is one uh, one dangerous team. If he wins it, uh, mm-hmm. hats off. Like he's deserved it too. So yeah, I, I'd be cool with either of those guys. I'm a Joe oh. Sackett. Burnaby Joe. So am I. <laughs> Joe Sackett. I remember that Olympic. Jesus took me right Team out of the Canada. 2002 when Star. they were. Yeah. Uh, Salt Lake City Olympics after a 50 year wait. Oh, yeah. Anyone that does well for Canada in international play is always a hero to me. Gotcha. Well, Bruce, let's leave it there for tonight. All right. And uh, we'll yeah, talk the again. only thing I'll add is Ken Holland did a very competent job this year. I've been analyzing the stuff that he's been doing in the last uh, couple of posts. I'm going to write one more about how he's dealt with young players. And I cool. am like his, 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 his uh, veteran savvy, if you will, as a GM, like some of the very sort of smooth attention to detail that he has, where he signs players and if he makes promises, he keeps the promises. And he, you know, he, he's on the up and up. He says what he means and he means what he says. And, and, and uh, I, I, you know, I think from a agent or player standpoint, negotiating with that guy would be a pleasure because I think it's uh, it's straight goods and and uh, he's he's done a lot of nice things. So I don't want to downplay him. I just think he started a task. It's but it should take him two or three years before he's on on track for GM of the year. Agreed. All right, Bruce. Thanks for talking tonight. All right. Thank you for listening, everyone. Stay well. And in the meantime. And in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.